Well, originally we weren't planning on starting a company, and I remember we went to NASA headquarters with some ideas of how to cut NASA mission costs, in, you know, by a factor of ten for certain, uh, you know, Earth observing or um, Earth orbiting missions. And I remember getting laughed out of the room at um, at NASA headquarters. So we kind of had no other choice but to sort of drink our own Kool Aid and go do it and and uh, prove our point. We wanted to really see if we could dramatically change a space architecture. And those technology trends and capabilities were decreased access, uh, a decreased cost for a mission to go to space, in particular with secondary payloads. Remember, this is well before reusable rockets, right, with uh, the landing of the, of the Falcon 9. Um, and number two was the miniaturization of technology, mainly driven by consumer devices. And at NASA Ames, we were right in the heart of Web2 community, a maker culture, a hacker culture, of prototyping things quickly, of failing forward, of iterating. Um, and then I think the third thing was um, just the obvious transition uh, with cloud computing. And so combining those things together, we, we really wanted to change how you designed a, a satellite. And, and really it was very much a stars aligned moment um, because we realized that the world for many challenges needed more rapid information about the planet, whether it's sustainability, climate change, whether it's agriculture developments, whether it's peace and security, whether it's tracking, you know, the, uh, uh, the ice caps to, to uh, the coral reefs. Basic mantra was <clears throat> uh, uh, to, to, to launch a fleet of satellites that would image the whole earth every day and get that data and make it accessible to more actors uh, than just the scientific and government actors that have been leveraging Earth observation uh, to date. And, and we felt very much we were in the right place at the right time with the skills and being in Silicon Valley, the ability to raise money and, uh, with, our, you know, uh, and with the world's needs, which was uh, for this information and, and, and the secular trends that demand it. Look, it's always a combination of luck and skill, um, um, and and you know, we we were uh, lucky to have had great mentors like Pete Warden at NASA Ames, who gave us a lot of um, uh, leverage to do different entrepreneurial things within the NASA framework and all the learnings that we got from NASA as a broad organization, and being in Silicon Valley and having a team that knew how to do spacecraft. Now, um, you know, lots of entrepreneur, lots of VCs wanted to fund space things. They, they, they are space geeks, a lot of them themselves. But they wanted a credible business plan and a credible team that knew how to do this. This wasn't, wasn't going to be something where someone who, um, would leave Stanford as an undergrad, drop out, and then start uh, something like that has happened in a lot of Silicon Valley companies because you couldn't, you would need the expertise in building and, and the systems engineering talent. So we felt we had enough of that. But not too much, if you like. So it was a, um, you know, not to be to be, if you like, anchored into the old aerospace approach. So we had enough of the knowledge to do it, but not too much that we were uh, tied down. Every time uh, you do a merger and acquisition, um, uh, it's really important to understand the the, uh, the context, the market at that point in time, and some of the. Um, and there are three main reasons why 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 we do uh, mergers and acquisition. One is to increase your your market potential or your total addressable market. Two is to accelerate your business strategy. And for us as a product led organization, it's accelerating our product strategy. And three, attract great people, right? Um, and that uh, and so all of those reasons we go through for everything that we actually think about doing. And it's a big deal. It's a huge amount of cost. And it's not just the acquisition price. It is you're changing your company. You're merging your cultures. Um, and that third piece is the one that, that really I care about a lot because culture to me is something that um, is created every day. It's created by who walks through the door. Um, and, uh, it, and even us, like what part of us that day walks through the door or new employees that come in, right? Values in action end up creating what it feels like to be together in the culture. And the biggest way that you do that is when you all of a sudden bring in a hundred people, right? It is going to change you. And so you want to change that with intention.
Well, we've done a lot of trying to understand and why satellites were expensive. Well, what were the cost drivers? And if your satellite cost a million dollars, you probably want to spend a billion testing it and uh, making sure it works. So it ends up being two billion and you um, can only launch one of them. So some really magic things happen if you go all the way to the low cost end. And so by borrowing technologies from other industries, including low cost computing platforms from the, from the mobile computing and, and, and cell phone industry, taking those technologies and deciding that we're going to go really cheap. Now it should work, but if we don't worry about losing one, then we don't have to test it too much so we can keep the cost down. So we were really careful about choosing technologies that allowed us to not end up in that vicious cycle of testing and being nervous. And so if it's really cheap, you can afford to lose one so you don't have to test it. So you can launch a lot of them. And that all cascaded to lead to the idea that we could um, launch a hundred satellites in an entire constellation and do that for about the price of one ordinary satellite. On the software side, uh, you know, we were born um, as an earth observation in, in, the, um, in the age of the cloud. So everything is uh, all cloud native, uh, taking that same type of software methodology of highly aligned, loosely coupled systems allows for us to really um, build a scalable core Earth observation data pipeline. And that, I think, is um, super critical toward um, realizing the potential of an Earth data platform to, to that just about every business and every government around the world will utilize by the end of, the, uh, uh, by the end of this decade. And it's an ecosystem. It's not just our platform. And that's where standards come in. And so I've been super proud of contributing, our, our community has contributed to the Open Geospatial Consortium uh, to come up with cloud native formats to make data interoperable um, and to, which then allows for users to get utility much quickly. We have been through 18 design build iterations of our satellites over the course of the last uh, 10 years. Uh, we're just about 10 years old as a company now. Um, we've launched on average four rockets per year for the last five years. So, you know, roughly every three months on typically, although like buses, they tend to come at once. So not always, <laughs> you know, spaced out, but like uh, on average four launches per year. So every three months or so we get to launch new satellites into space. And what we typically have done is say we're launching 20 satellites. We put up two that have tech demos capabilities for that test a new camera system, test a new hard drive or a new sensor of some kind. And then if that all works, then we integrate that into the next generation. So, you know, at least a thousand fold increase in what I would call cost performance. You know, the bits per dollar if it is a, you know, a crude metric of, of what, what, what is valued in Earth observation. And that crude metric has at least gone up a thousand X, if not 10,000 X over the period of planet's history. We live in a 21st century world of wicked complex problems with 20th century economic institutions that was set up after World War II and Bret Woods and uh, 19th century government institutions. And uh, the speed to which we are adapting to the, um, the challenges that we have on our planet is uh, we, we can't rely on our institutions alone in order to do that. Um, and uh, you know, with technology, with uh, a sensor network distributed on the ground in air and in space, we have the ability to measure now more things. Uh, and I think that will then change economics. I think um, uh, one of the largest things that, uh, that we need to do is to shift how we value things on the planet and to get toward a full cost economic system. And that, that is about valuing fresh water and, and clean air, carbon storage, biodiversity. Um, and our sector of Earth observation, when you when you take EO plus AI, um, I think that we can play a hugely critical role to accelerate that that sustainability transition of the global economy. Our goal is to help. There's no less than helping us to manage the Earth sustainably. I am incredibly proud of some of the projects that we have done, and there's no question we've we've helped enable our partners to have big impact. And I say it carefully like that because we're not having that impact directly. We're providing our data to, to NGOs and, 
and non-profit, uh, other non-profit and educational research institutions and governments that are uh, doing important pro uh, projects in sustainability. Um, but again, we give you a couple of examples. Um, we, we work with Norway, our, 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 the government of Norway sponsors access to our data to 64 tropical countries in the tropical rainforest that have all of the lungs of the planet in the tropical rainforest. And we help those 64 forestry ministries in those 64 countries to prevent and stop illegal deforestation. That's huge. I was speaking to one of the environment ministers from one of these countries um, recently and they said uh, from the year before to the year of using our data, um, they went from 800 actions, which is where they go and stop an illegal deforestation event, to 8,000 actions in that year. Um, so that's an important impact. Um, a second project I'll tell you about um, uh, is we, we did a project called the Allen Coral Atlas, which monitors all the world's coral reefs. It's the first base map, in a way, of all the world's coral reefs. And um, since then, we've had about half a dozen countries and then and 30 more efforts with NGOs and countries to create marine protected areas around these. And you might go, well, you know, Sri Lanka, for example, is one of these countries. It had a marine, uh, it had a cor some coral reefs. And you might think, well, they must have known about those coral reefs. And indeed, they did. But because we provided a precise map, they knew exactly where to protect. And because we can help give them information like, is there signs of ocean bleaching or challenges to the reefs or illegal fishing or trawling, uh, they have actionable data. And also because it's publicly available on Alan Coral Atlas.org in that case, it's, it's not ignorable. And so it's a carrot and a stick that enables accountability. But on the commercial side, even where we're helping agricultural clients, that's increasing efficiency of our land in agriculture and helping those soils become more sustainable. That's important because agriculture is the prime driver of deforestation. We need our present agricultural land to be more efficient. So even our, if you like, bread and butter business is having an important impact for sustainability. I think there is still room for success and innovation, but I think the innovation is the key part. So Planet Now is a 10 year old company and it's surprising to me that no one has yet dethroned Planet because there hasn't really in other industries or anywhere in the world been, been a technological innovation yet that has added another you know, fat order of magnitude capability or reduced cost by an additional order of magnitude. So a lot of the companies today are kind of similar, kind of like Planet version 1.1. What I'm really waiting for is some profound new technology to come out of a lab somewhere that allows us to build spacecraft 10 times cheaper. And then I think we'll see some really cool innovation from that. I mean, where I mainly see it going next is, the, uh, is what I call up the stack. It's, it's getting towards more value proposition. You know, um, just talking about planet for a second, the countries um, that deal with satellite data, whether that's NASA that uses our data for climate science or the NRO that uses for security, or big companies like uh, 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 Corteva or a, uh, in agriculture or Google in maps, they can get value from satellite data today because they have thousands of people <laughs> that know how to produce and, and uh, sorry, process and, and digest satellite data. But there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of other smaller companies, an insurance company, a hedge fund, a, you know, a, a little NGO, a, a, a team of developers in Silicon Valley trying to start up a new company who can't get value because they don't have 20 PhDs in satellite image processing on, on hand, you know. And so we've got to build the tools that enable those partners to get value. Um, and that's not just planet, right? That's a whole ecosystem. That's, and it's not just planet, it's data. It's an ecosystem of data providers, but it's mainly about the software that builds on top that enables the extraction out of the information to uh, actually make, take action. We didn't build planet to help humans observe the earth better. We built planet to help us humans to take better action. <laughs>